Hey everybody, Evan Savage here. I'm the pastor of Grassroots Church. Thank you for joining us uh, by watching our messages from this past week or maybe weeks before. We are glad that you're taking time out of your week to learn, to engage with our church from an online point of view. We would love for you to join us on Sunday mornings for tangible community worship and of course some messages as well. Uh, and if that interests you, you, we would love for you to join us at 10 a.m. on Sunday mornings. Thank you again, and I hope that this message is edifying to your spirit. Now, good morning. Welcome, welcome, church. Happy time change Sunday. Woohoo! Woohoo! We had a, uh, uh, Evan, Craig, and I had a teach team meeting on Tuesday, and Evan said, Jeff, you're teaching on Sunday, it's time change, and I won't be there. <laughs> you know how he does that little thing? <laughs> yeah, whatever, 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 Evan. So today we're going to be continuing our uh, For the Sake of the uh, City series, and today we're going to be talking about everybody's favorite topic, Work work. Uh, the, the exact thing that you want to think about and talk about on a Sunday, right, is work, is work. Um, so before we jump into that, uh, let me pray for us. Father God, thank you so much for who you are. Thank you that you are creator, that you are father. Thank you for adopting us into your family by the sacrifice of Jesus. Thank you for the Holy Spirit, who is the breath of the living God, who comforts us, who teaches us, who transforms us. And Father, right now I pray that what we do not know, teach us, what we do not have, give us, and what we are not, please gently make us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so to set us on a trajectory to talk about work, we have to start, I feel like I'm detached from you guys, but that's okay. Um, I want to be detached. Um, <laughs> thanks. I love how interactive this crowd is. Um, I feel like I'm being heckled. Is this vaudeville? Is somebody going to throw a, a lettuce cabbage at me later? Um, so to set us on a trajectory to talk about work, we have to start at the, at the beginning of the Bible, in the first few pages. So Genesis 1, Genesis 2, and then Genesis 3. So what I'm going to do is simply just read a few verses. We're going to see the discrepancy. Uh, then we're going to talk a little bit about my Genesis 3 history of work. And then we're going to uh, go into my observations of work, uh, my reasoning and questions of work. And then finally, we're going to get to the most important piece of today, and that is what Jesus has to say about work, because he actually has quite a bit to say about work. So let's begin Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. Starting in Genesis 1, 28 through 30, the author of Genesis says this, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and every creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I now give you every seed bearing plant on the face of the entire earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the animals of the earth, and to every bird of the air, and to all the creatures that move on the ground, everything that has living breath in it, I give every green plant for food. It was so. Genesis 2, 15 through 16. The Lord God took the man and placed him in the orchard in Eden to care for it and to maintain it. Then the Lord God commanded the man, you may freely eat fruit from every tree of the orchard. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will surely die. Now things go off the rails. Genesis 3, 17 through 19. And he said to the man, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, do not eat from it. The ground is cursed because of you. 
You will eat from it by means of painful labor all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. You will eat bread by the sweat of your brow until you return to the ground, since you were taken from it. For you are dust, and you will return to dust. Okay. So let's just take a look at the stark differences between Genesis 1 and 2 and Genesis 3 as it pertains to work. So starting out, we see that the ground is fertile and produces fruit in Genesis 1 and 2. Okay? So um, at the very beginning, work is very rewarding. So what their hands found to do, there was, there was a reward. There was something there that was, oh, I have worked, I have, I, have, um, I have put in the effort, and look what the result is. And it was very re- rewarding. But then in Genesis 3, we see that the ground is cursed and produces thorns and thistles. Now, if you know anything about thorns and thistles, that is painful. That is hard. It's hard work. And it's fruitless. So work is seen as fruitless. It's hard. It's difficult. There's no reward in work in Genesis 3. Going back to Genesis 1 and 2, work is characterized by subduing, ruling, caring, and maintaining. So this was how God intended for man to take the creation and harness its potential and use its resources for their benefit through creativity and the labor of work. So this was how man displayed God's image to the world. It was by subduing, ruling, caring, and maintaining. What is God like? He is a ruling, uh, caring, maintaining, and a subduing God. In chapter 3, we see that work is characterized as hard and painful. The result of the painful labor is the sweat of the brow. That is the result of fruitless labor and painful labor, sweat on the brow. Back to Genesis 1 and 2. So after you work, it says you eat really well. Um, And that's no surprise, considering that the ground was fertile, and it produced really good fruit, really good tasteful fruit. And that food came out of the abundance of God's blessing and love and care for his creation and they were able to eat to their heart's content. In Genesis 3, we see that after you work, you eat gross food. How can I say that the food was gross? Have you ever tried to eat food that was produced from a thorny and thistly and unfertile ground? It is smaller, it is uh, less uh, tasteful, there is less nutrition, it's just not good food. Um, This is interesting. Um, So the curse focuses on eating in a measure-for-measure justice. Because the man and woman sinned by eating the forbidden fruit, God will forbid the ground to cooperate. And so it will be through painful toil that they will have to endure their eating. So yeah, yeah. The, the food that they produced and, and um, grew in the thorny and thistly ground was gross. Genesis 1 and 2 says, uh, at the end, work is life-giving. Labor is, is life-giving. Um, you see that uh, when they work and toil in the ground, it produced this amazing, bountiful uh, uh, harvest. And, and we even see that uh, they were to be, f- to be fruitful and to multiply. So this, this labor and this, this work was, was life-giving. And then in Genesis chapter 3, we see that labor brought about death. So you're going you're gonna to work, you're going to work, you're going to work, and then you're going to die. So work in Genesis 3 does not produce life. It, its inevitable end is death, which is depressing. All right, time for the benediction. That's great news. See you, see you later. All right, have a great week. But this is, this is the reality in which we live, isn't it? 
We, we long for a Genesis, and, uh, Genesis 1 and 2 type of relationship with our work, but we are stuck in this Genesis 3 reality that work is hard and it's toil and it's painful and we have really hard days. Our boss is a jerk. Our coworkers are awful. Right? It's hard. So now I want to talk about my Genesis 3 work experience. And you guys can laugh at my career arc. So when I was 18, I uh, started selling women's shoes. Yes, those stilettos look very good on you, right? That'll be $100. Um, So initially, it started as uh, me selling men's shoes, but they were like, hey, Jeff, if if you want to make more money, you should come downstairs and sell to the women. I was like, uh. Okay, so I did it. So, I don't know, 9% commission, what's it going to hurt? So, um, it hurt, yeah, it was, it was not fun. I saw a lot of hammer toes, a lot of bunions. Uh, those senior citizen Wednesdays were not fun. When you had all the blue hairs come in, I'm like, where's my 25% discount? I would need my life stride shoes. And I was like, I can tell you where to shove these life stride shoes, old lady. You know, uh, Painful toil. It was, it was hard work. I hate it. And then you had to get up uh, around Christmas time and the, the Black Fridays, uh, four years of those. It was getting up at like four in the morning. And it's like, all for these shoes? Seriously? What do you do? I would rather much be in bed sleeping and waiting for football to come on and watching football. Um, so... I go from selling shoes, I knew that that was not the career path that I wanted to take. Uh, As a man selling women's shoes, that was, uh, everybody called me Al Bundy, if you know anything with married (laughs) children. Yeah, I was the Al Bundy. Everybody, even everybody in the store made fun of me. I can't imagine what the people coming in and out of the store were saying about me. That's fine, whatever. (sighs) So I, I moved from selling shoes and I think, man, what kind of, what kind, of, what kind of thing can I do in my career that I'm interested in? I'm like, oh, how about broadcasting? So I decided to, to, um, to go to the Illinois Center for Broadcasting where they say that your broadcasting dreams come true, which is a lie. It's a complete lie. Um, by broadcasting dreams, they mean uh, low-paying promotion assistant nightmares. Is that's, that's really what it was. So uh, I went to the Illinois Center for Broadcasting in Lombard, Illinois. I got an internship here locally at the Cumulus Broadcasting, home of 97 ZOK and 96.7 Eagle and WROK 1440 and 98.5 Country. I forget what the call numbers are for that. WXXQ, I think. So, um, yeah, uh, broadcasting. So that was a very interesting experience. So not only was the pay very bad, uh, at school they would say, okay, so this is a very competitive job market. So you have to be willing to go wherever to, to make money and to work your, to work your way up. So I thought, okay, that seems kind of cool. But then I, I realized that, okay, I'm going to have to go from where I live to, like, Billings, Montana, to do, like, a morning show gig, making, like, $10,000 a year. Then I'm going to have to go there. Then I'm going to have to go to some other smaller market and try to work my... It's just that was not in the cards for me. I didn't want to go through the... I didn't want to go through that. Um, so my dream of being like an AM sports, like news update guy or like a program manager, just, I was like, eh, I'm going to push those off to the side. So as I was going to broadcasting school, I was at the time, I was going to Four City Baptist Church. And at the time, um, their youth coordinator decided to quit and he, uh, went off to college and, um, I uh, ended up having a conversation and multiple meetings with the pastor, and he said, you know, I, th- I know you have a lot of this broadcasting thing going on, and I know that that's really what you want to do with, with your life, but I think in the meantime, uh, I would really want you to, to just do this youth coordinator thing. He said, all you have to do is um, 
schedule a youth activity every once in a while. And you don't even have to teach Sunday school. You can have somebody else do that. I was like, okay. That was not appealing to me. So um, I thought about it, prayed about it, and I was like, you know what? Why not? So I ended up doing it. I was not a fan of middle schoolers and high schoolers, just, you know, uh, the, the BO smells and, uh, you know, the fart smells and the van. Not a huge fan of those smells. Um, but after a couple months of, of being involved in youth and, and taking them to Green Bay for some concert and driving back and the experiences that... Uh, we, we had, I began to say, you know what, this is actually pretty awesome. And um, my, my work began to uh, feel fruitful, and I began to see purpose in what I was doing. And, and it was at that same time where I was like, you know, broadcasting is kind of whatever. And then eventually, uh, Cumulus Broadcasting, as is in uh, media, um, they were sold to a much larger conglomerate, and they decided to make cuts. And uh, who do they normally cut when uh, they need to make cuts? The lowly promotions assistant who is making Panera runs. Um, that was me. So I didn't have a job. So then I decided to put all of my effort into the youth coordinator thing. So I would, I would, I would begin to, to learn and try to understand the scriptures. I would meet daily with the pastor. We began this, this very life-on-life discipleship process. And eventually, they're like, dude, you are, you, are a, you are a legitimate pastor. You are pastoring these kids. And it came to the point where I would even teach uh, on Sunday mornings. I even started a Sunday night uh, service for youth and college kids. And um, even spoke at InterVarsity at Rock Valley College one time. That was actually twice. That was actually pretty, which is funny. I was like, I didn't go to college. Ha, ha, ha. Um, I was like, have fun with that, losers. Um, but I, I immensely enjoyed my experience as a youth pastor. And then also si- simultaneously, I, w- I, was, I was doing this youth pastor thing, and then my, sin- uh, my, my aunt, Cindy Swanson, who, uh, I don't know if that name rings any bells, she was uh, the news director at 101 QFL, 91 GSL, for years and years and years. Um, she got a tip from somebody um, who used to work at the old TV51, which was the old Christian TV station in town that was on Broadcast Parkway in Loves Park. Uh, this guy, he was uh, kind of a, I don't want to say a big shot, but he did a lot of the work at that um, TV station. And he came into the radio station and was pitching this idea of a new internet TV station. It was called You Choose TV. And he was just selling this as, hey, I'm just throwing this out there. I want some backing. I want some support. And then my aunt was like, who, you know, who are you going to have work here? He was like, you know, I'm still really looking for people. So my aunt was like, ha, huh, my nephew has a broadcasting degree, and he would be perfect for this. So she tells me about it. We, we, I connect with this guy, and he sells me this idea. And I'm like, okay, that's kind of cool, kind of interesting. And he says, you know, you would be the host of this show called State Line Spin. You'd go around uh, the area, and you would basically profile businesses, and you would interview the business owners. I was like, okay. He's like, and then probably on the side, you would do some advertising sales and stuff like that. And I said, okay. And then he said, uh, eventually, I I looked to probably pay you around $600 a week. And I was like, what? $600 a week? Are you kidding me? Right now, I'm only making like $250 every other week. $600 a week? I was like, ka-ching. I was like, I could buy a new Honda. Um... (laughs) So then I decide to do this simultaneously with being a youth coordinator, youth pastor. So, um, so I begin to do this, uh, this you choose thing, and uh, come to find out this guy was not organized. He didn't have a real clear direction of what the company was going to be. Um, he did not have his financials in order. Uh, he was basically paying and funding for everything off of like a lawsuit that he had, like two years before that. So I do about 
four episodes of State Line Spin, which I have checked. This is not on the interwebs. So you can't go back and Google, you choose TV, Jeff Swanson, loser. It's not going to show up. It's not going to show up, okay? I've checked. So thankfully, that's just, it's not, there's no history of it. He wiped it away. Um, so, you know, I'm, I, at this point, it's just you know, two, three, four episodes in. I'm like, man, I'm not getting, he's not paying me anything. And the other two guys, he's like, yeah, he's paying us. I'm like, are you for real? It's like, man, I'm the, I'm the guy in front of the camera. I'm the talent. Where's my money at, man? Jeff needs his cheddar, you know what I'm saying? Um, and uh, so it, it came to the point where he was very shoddy as well about actually showing up and doing work. And, his, and the thing that was funny about that is the offices for You Choose TV were at this guy's house. Uh, so a couple times I would come, I'd, I'd le- I would let myself into his house, and I would, I would say, Andrew, Andrew, and you'd be nowhere to be found. So I'd shoot him a text, like, dude, where are you at? He's like, oh, my internet's down, force day off. Weep. I'm like, what? This guy is insane. So eventually it came to the point where I let myself into his house uh, on, on I think it was a a Thursday. And um, I see that he's seated at his kitchen table crying. And at this point, I'm like, this is not good. I don't do well with tears, and then I especially don't do well with men and tears. It's just not, I'm not geared. I don't don't know how to, like, comfort that. so we sit down, he's like, Jeff, you know, I just appreciate all your hard work, and, you know, I know I couldn't pay you, and you've worked really hard. Um, I'm like, yeah. And um, he's like, but there's, but there's one thing that I, I want to give you as compensation. I was like, okay. He was like, follow me down to my basement. And I was like, I don't know about this. Is there a pit down there he's going to throw me in? Um, so I follow him down to his basement, and he said, you know, I know that you're involved with youth. And at one time in my life, I was involved heavily with, with a youth group. And we would play laser tag all the time. I was like, okay, that's cool. And he said, over here, I have this box of old laser guns. So, so my compensation for about two solid months of work was an old box of laser guns. That, that's not going to generate more laughs from you guys? Compensation, laser guns. And they didn't work. And they didn't work. And they did not work. So I took the boxes in, but as my compensation, I went directly to the church and I said, these are going to sit in the basement. I eventually, when we sold the Four City Baptist building back in 2011, I took that box, looked at it, and I threw it directly into the dumpster. And I laughed and I laughed and I laughed about my horrible experience at You Choose TV. Uh, so that was kind of a disaster. So, but then I'm doing this youth pastor thing and I'm, I'm really enjoying it. I'm finding contentment, I'm finding fulfillment. And I eventually say, this is what I want to do. I want to do vocational ministry for the rest of my life. I don't know if it's going to be a youth pastor. I don't know if it's going to be a pastor. I don't know if it's going to be a teaching pastor. I don't know if it's going to be a church planner somewhere. All I know is that I want to do vocational ministry. I want to teach the Bible for the rest of my life. And uh, it got to the point where uh, we changed uh, ministry philosophies uh, at Forest City Baptist Church uh, back in 2010, babe, 2000 something. And uh, with the change in, in uh, really ministry paradigms of uh, doing like this style, we actually uh, broke down the church into uh, multiple house churches and had multiple elders in each house church doing house churches. So not, but I was committed to that. But then uh, with that ministry philosophy change, a lot of people did not jive with that. They were not comfortable with that. So a lot of people left. And if you know anything about when people leave churches, that also means that money leaves churches. So that means that uh, Jeff doesn't have a job anymore. So uh, eventually, I, um, I was still kind of 
getting paid to do kind of like odd jobs around the church. Um, but with the full understanding of, Jeff, you have to find another job. I was like, okay, I can, I can do that. So, so I make the jump from being a pastor and doing what I really wanted to do with my whole life to then working, into, working in a factory at Rockford Toolcraft. Um, high quality uh, dyes and stampings out on Kishwaukee Research Parkway. So I knew the HR director and he was able to get me a job. And that's when I began my supply chain experience um, in manufacturing in 2013. So with this became, became a lot of anxiety. I didn't know anything about dyes. Is that the, the, the drops you put in the water and then it turns it green or something like that kind of thing? Like, I didn't know what that was. I didn't know what a stamping was. I definitely didn't know what A2 tool steel was or D2 tool steel or 4140 or A36 or 316. Or Are you impressed with my materials knowledge here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jim's like, yeah, that's great. Keep talking about that. Uh, how about O1? Is that, can you mention that? Um, <laughs> He's like, keep it on stainless. How about 6061 aluminum? <laughs> um, so, uh, but, uh, so, I'm, so I'm inserted into this industry that I have nothing, I have no industry knowledge. I have no, I don't know what a socket head cap screw is. I don't know anything. That produced a lot of anxiety for me. Um, and, and, and through my experiences there, I, 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 I felt like, man, if I could just quit this, if I could just find a pastor job somewhere, that's what I want to do. I didn't see, I didn't see how God was orchestrating my life in this specific season of my life to help me understand the value of work. Um, so I overlooked a lot of things, and I just wanted to escape it because it felt, it felt like a daily grind, and I just was not used to that. But uh, I was at Toolcraft for about four years. I gained a lot of experience, and then I was able to move to Woodward into a supply chain position. I loved working at Woodward. I worked there for about two and a half years. But when you um, move from like a, like a small to medium-sized business to a major corporation, there comes, you know, like careerism and corporatism and cor uh, climbing the, uh, the corporate ladder. That's just stuff that I was not used to, and that was icky. That is very icky. And I also had a boss that was not very good. So that was a thorn and a thistle in my daily life. So then, pre-pandemic, I decide, you know what? Um, I'm just gonna try to find a supply chain management gig. And I did. I found a supply chain management gig at Advanced Machine and Engineering. And so I moved from Woodward to a place that I really loved. I loved all my coworkers there to a place uh, that after week number one, I'd realized that I had made one of the biggest mistakes of my life. It's like, oh man, I went from, I went from like the cushiness of this corporate life to, to, to back to like this, this job shop, the, the, like the dirty, the, the grind, and uh, it was unorganized. Um, it was stressful. My boss had a lot of unrealistic expectations for me. He was not a very kind guy. Um, he did not allow me to actually manage. He was a micromanager, so that was not good for me. Um, so then eventually I was only there for about a year and a half, and then I'm back at Woodward, where um, I can gladly say I will probably work until the day I die. I hope I actually die in my cubicle. Um, <laughs> That'll be really gross for everybody there. Like, oh, Jeff died there. But that is my, um, that's my Genesis 3 um, story of work. In it comes a lot of frustrations. In it comes a lot of joys. In it comes some confusion, discontentment, fru fruitlessness, anxiety, depression. So let's talk about those. Let's talk about the thorns and the thistles. Number one is anxiety. I mean, come on. I had massive amounts of anxiety. And the anxiety really stemmed from three things. 
Number one, it was from working in industries I had no idea about. Um, uh, learning on the fly is not something that I'm really good at. So, and then especially placing me into an environment where I have just no frame of reference, no, no history, that was very difficult for me. That, was, that produced a lot of worry in my heart. The second thing was money and provision. There was a lot of times in my life where I just didn't have the amount of work that would provide for Tracy and I. And then I had kids, and then the, the jobs didn't really provide enough for me to provide for my wife and kids. So then I had to find other employment. And then the third thing that um, produced anxiety in my life and in my heart was uh, bad bosses, hard bosses with unrealistic expectations. The second thing was identity, identity crisis. So my identity was often found in the job I had, job titles and career focus. So I've allowed pride to come from my job titles and shame to come from my job titles. Ecclesiastes 4.4 says, Then I considered all the skillful work that is done. Surely it is nothing more than competition between one person and another. And often in the midst of that competition, we identify with our wins and with our losses, don't we? In the midst of our work, we don't do something right or we do something really well, we begin to, that is the source of our identity. I am that thing that I just did. We identify with how many hours a week we work to somehow prove our value. We identify with pay raises and bonuses. We identify with our career. And it's all utter nonsense. It's all utter nonsense. The third thorn and thistle was uh, discontentment. Discontentment. Sometimes my job didn't provide me with the rewarding feeling of fulfillment and contentment. Shouldn't you enjoy what you do? Shouldn't you see some type of purpose and reward from your daily work? There always seemed that there was something missing and that I needed to do something that I was passionate about. Again, Ecclesiastes 2.17. So I hated life because the work that is done under the sun was grievous to me. All of it is meaningless. A chasing after the wind. Hevel. It's hevel. It's smoke. It's vapor. It's like chasing after the wind. I identified with the writer of Ecclesiastes. It's all meaningless. Discontentment. Um, fruitless. It's worthless. The fourth thorn is depression. So I guarantee you, some of you in this room, probably around, uh, around 2 o'clock today, you will experience something called the Sunday afternoon blues. You will begin to feel this feeling of, crap, I have to go to work tomorrow. I have to drive into that place I have to get out of my car. I have to make that, that, that walk into the doors. I have to walk past Joey, who is a, a dork. I don't like him. And then I have to sit in my cubicle, and I have to experience all of these mundane emails. You just begin to play through all of the different work scenarios that you hate. For me, when I was at Advanced Machine and Engineering, the, the, the Sunday afternoon blues would actually start on Saturday. I'm not kidding. I am not kidding. Uh, the, the expectations were so high, and um, the amount of work so high, and the dysfunction so high, and the unorganization so bad that I began to think about it around Saturday at noon. And I would even get on my work phone and just begin to try to get ahead of it, get ahead of it. And I'd go to work. I'd work from like 6, 6.30 to about 4 um, at the office, and then I would come home. I would sit down on my phone, say hi to Tracy and the kids, and then I would veg out, and I would try to take a mental vacation. It's like I just need a mental break. And then I would uh, get up from the couch. I would stop watching the news or the office or whatever. And then I would get back on my phone and I would start looking at my emails. I would start looking at the meetings that I had to do. Well, that caused anxiety, which led to a massive amount of depression. Massive amount of depression. If you don't believe me, just ask Tracy. It was awful. 
It was awful. Thorns and thistles. Those are real. I'm sure you guys have more. And you guys could probably write those down. Like, yes, this is a thorn. I experience this every day. This is a hard thing. Uh, I, 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 I experience this from my boss. It's very, very difficult. It's a thorn. It's a thistle. It's part of the reality of living in a Genesis 3 world. So from the very beginning of the series, Evan kind of, uh, he presented the, the framework as um, observe uh, reason and then offer a third way. So I just made my observations. Um, actually, I'm about to make my observations. Um, so let me, let me um, just give you the observations of, of what I have seen within culture the last 20 plus years of my career. These are things that I've heard from my coworkers. These are things that I've seen in the everyday work world. Um, and they're not, they're not really my opinions. They're just things that I've drawn from my experience. Number one, work sucks. Right? How many of you heard that at work? Man, this job sucks. My boss sucks. This company sucks. I am underpaid. I am underappreciated. Everybody's, yeah, I don't know. I guess you can't. We're our own legit church. I just said sucks like five times. Sorry, guys. I think, I, and I think I said crap earlier. I don't know. If I didn't, what did I say? Dork? Yeah. Uh, I have a potty mouth. I'm sorry. But we know, we know that this is how the culture views work. Everybody's working for the weekend, right? Lover Boy, Canada's best band, Lover Boy, uh, which I think is really just about a, a girl. But, um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's get me through this Monday through Friday thing so that I can live my life how I want on the weekend. How about the, how about the song uh, by Johnny Paycheck? Take this job and shove it. Take this job and shove it. How many times have we wanted to say that to our boss? When I was working at Rockford Toolcraft, there was a, there was a, there was a guy in quote, and he's, he had been there for a long time. And every single Monday, somebody would come up to his cube and be like, hey, John, how was your weekend? And he would, without any hesitation, say, too short. <laughs> he was counting down the days to retirement. Every time I'd hear that, I'd be like, man, that was good. I got to use that one. Um, another thing that kind of reveals uh, this, this, um, this observation is uh, uh, Mike Judge. Do you guys know who Mike Judge is? He is the, uh, the writer of the American classic Beavis and Butthead. He is the writer of Beavis and Butthead and also King of the Hill. And in the late 90s, he wrote a movie called Office Space. Um, if you've never seen Office Space, I don't think I could actually endorse it in church. Uh, I can't. I've already said sucks and crap, so I'm not going to endorse Office Space to you. Um, but that, that movie is an encapsulation. It is an encapsulation of the hardships and the mundane activities of the Monday through Friday work-a-day world. But also, what's the mentality? This is terrible. What do we have to what do we have to deal with every Monday through Friday? Has a very cynical Gen X vibe about that movie. Uh, number two, uh, work is work is my identity. This is who I am. This is why I exist. And when you begin to to p possess that type of mentality, it inevitably ends up in a thing called workaholism. Workaholism. The term was coined in 1971 by minister and psychologist Wayne Oates, who described workaholism as the compulsion or the uncontrollable need to work incessantly. Essentially, it is an addiction, an unhealthy addiction to work. Melissa A. Clark, she's a PhD, she gives us a few um, 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 hints um, or signs if you are um, engaging in workaholism or falling into workaholism. She says, um, the first sign is feeling compelled to work because of internal pressures. 
Do you feel con compelled to just work because you're just, you have all of this anxiety, you just feel like the way that you can get it out is by working constantly and constantly? Number two is having persistent thoughts about work when not working. And the third and last thing is working beyond what is reasonably expected of the worker, which is as established by the requirements of the job or basic economic needs, despite the potential for negative consequences. So you will work beyond what is reasonably ex expected of you um, um, to, uh, to, to put your, your, even your marriage uh, at stake or your relationship with your kids at stake. Workaholism. An example of this is uh, in my earlier 20s, I used to play basketball quite a bit. And there was this kid who would, who would play basketball, and he would, there would, we'd go through weeks where we wouldn't see him, and then he would show up. He'd be like, hey, man, where were you? He's like, oh, man, I worked about like 80 hours a week last week. I just couldn't make it. I'm like, oh, whoa, that's, that's a lot of work. <laughs> And then we, he'd go like another two or three weeks and wouldn't see him. And then he would show up and be like, man, how was it going? Like, oh man, I worked about 100 hours last week. It got to the point where we would just make the joke. We would make the joke, dude, yeah, I worked about 7,000 hours last week. And then I got off of work and just decided to work about another 700 more. You know, it's like just that workaholism mentality. It's just not healthy. Work is the source of my identity. Um, and we even have social networks set up for this. LinkedIn, you guys on LinkedIn? Boo. Oh, I mean, I have a LinkedIn. I mean, it's what got me back into Woodward, but it is just, boo. The next thing, work relationships don't matter. So at a couple of my former employers, there was little to no value placed upon relationships with coworkers. I always think of the, the Ron Swanson quote to Lori Nope in, um, in a Parks and Rec where he said, we're just workplace proximity associates. Relationships don't matter. There was, a, there was, also, there was also poor treatment of people in the name of business. Uh, from, in, in my experience, from like Christian people who treated people horribly. Oh, it's just business. But no, it's not just business. That guy is a person, and he has a family. It's not just business. The next thing, work as utopia. Work as utopia. You guys have probably heard this. If you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. That's not true. We just talked about it. Genesis 3, we live in a Genesis 3 world. If you love what you do, you never have to. No, that's, that's insane. That's insanity. Or there's this my mentality of my work will change the world. I think that like a lot of like millennials and like younger people are just like, my work is going to change the world. It's like, no, not, it's not really. It's not really going to change the world. It's important. It's important. But it's, it's not going to, you're not going to change the world through your job. This, this last one is just like a pet peeve of mine, and I just felt like throwing it in here. <laughs> we'll see if you guys agree. Um, work comes with a different language. Here's an example, okay? We need to snag the low-hanging fruit and develop some core competencies. <laughs> Interpretation. We need to do the easy stuff and the important stuff. Here's another one. The key takeaways are a game changer. Interpretation. The important points are uh, important. Here's the next one. I have a Teams call, so I won't have any bandwidth. Interpretation. I have a virtual meeting, and I will be busy. Now, this, is, this last one I have heard before, like legitimately heard before. We need a DMS to brainstorm and flow down best practices in order to develop go-dos and quick wins, which will produce department synergy and success. Uh, you, you basically just went into like a generator and just said, generate a sentence for me, and then you just said that. Interpretation. We need to have a meeting to discuss how to do something so that we can get the job done as a team. Okay? I mean, yeah, I'm sure you guys have experienced some of the worthless and useless jargon 
that comes in the business world. So now here's, here are my questions. So I observe, and then we ask questions, and then we offer a third way. So I observed, and now here are my questions. Why do I have to do this? Why do I have to do this job? What are you working for? What are you working for? Who are you working for? What idols of my heart does work reveal? And how do you view your bosses and coworkers? I'm not going to answer those. I'm just going to let it sit there. Why do, I, why do I have to do this? Why do I have to get up Monday through Friday and do this job? What am I working for? What are you working for? Who am I working for? Who are you working for? What idols of my heart does work reveal? Am I working for the wrong thing? And then how do you view your bosses and coworkers? Do you view them as image bearers of God who are living in a fallen world? Or do you just view them as coworkers and bosses? It's a necessary evil relationship. Hopefully you can write those down and just think about those. It's important to just sit in those questions. Hopefully you take like 10 minutes and just, hopefully it'll, it'll help drill down into your heart, into your motivations, and help you think deeply about why you're working and what you're working for and your outlook on people. Okay, so let's get to Jesus because Jesus has some things to say about work. So we exist in a Genesis 3 world of work, but it doesn't end with Genesis 3. It doesn't end with the thorns and the thistles. Jesus changes work by his life, death, and resurrection. So as it says in 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 22, but as it is, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For just as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. Jesus is the one who will make things right again. Therefore, since we believe in him, he will make all things new in and through his spirit. And he offers us a different way to see and engage the world. All right, real quick, let's look at Jesus and work. I know, time change Sunday, Jeff's going like 50 minutes. Sorry, guys. I see you guys. You guys are thinking it. I'm thinking it myself. Number one, let's understand that Jesus validates work through his incarnation. Jesus validates work through his incarnation. So as was customary for boys in that day, Jesus probably apprenticed alongside his father Joseph by age 12. So since Jesus began his public ministry at about 30, we would, uh, he would have worked about 18 years. That's six times as long as his three-year public ministry. So the incarnational life of Jesus was not limited to the daily grind of work. In his incarnation, he shows us the importance of working a Monday through Friday day job. The word became flesh, dwelt among us, and he worked a backbreaking blue-collar job of carpentry. And really, he was a stonemason. That's what he did. So the experiences that you feel Monday through Friday, the anxiety and the worries and all of those things, all the pressures and the deadlines and stuff, Jesus experienced all of that. He experienced that. He valued work and he values your work. He valued his job and he values your job. The second thing is this. Let's see our true identity. Let's see our true identity. Your career and job title is not your identity and does not determine your worth and value as a person. 
Your value is more than dollar signs on your paycheck. The description of who you are as a person is more than your job title. Your identity is found in the person and the work of Jesus. He lived for you, he died for you, he rose again for you, and he's coming back for you. And by all of this, he reconciles you back into a relationship with the Father. You are a child of God. You are a recipient of grace, compassion, and love, and are to share the same love with the world. That is what defines you. That is your identity. Not a job title, not a job description, Jesus. Jesus gets to identify you. Career successes or failures cannot trump Jesus. And it cannot trump the inherent truth that you are an image bearer of God. Also, the career successes and failures or job titles of others does not trump their inherent value as an image bearer of God. Sometimes I have felt judged by others, and I feel like that my identity was being questioned by other people by the job that I had, but there have also been times where I have judged other people by the job that they have. Both of those are bad. Wrong mentality. Wrong way to think. Next thing. Let's realize who we truly work for. This is going to sound really churchy, but it's true, and we need to realize it. If we are Christians, we work for the Lord. Let's think through this logically real quick. Who is the one who ultimately provides for us? Who is the one who ultimately provides for you? God. Who is the one who has given you the talents, the skills, the motivations, and the spiritual gifts to work? God. Who is renewing all things and establishing the kingdom in the world? God. So who do you ultimately work for? You work for God. Colossians 3, 23 through 24 says, Whatever you do, do it from the heart, as something done for the Lord and not for people. Knowing that you will receive the reward of an inheritance from the Lord, you serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Next thing, let's bring about a kingdom mentality in the world through our work. So when we pray, Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we are asking God to bring about the way of Jesus through the transformational work of the Holy Spirit in and through us in the mundane aspects of daily life. You want your neighbor and your coworker and your boss to experience the kingdom of God? Live by the power of the Spirit every day. Next thing. Let's view work as God providing for us our daily bread. That's what work is. It's God providing you. So when we, when we pray, uh, give us today our daily bread, how does God give us our daily bread? Does it fall from the sky like magic? On a platter? Manna? No, it does not. What God has done is he has given you a job. And he provides, he provides for you and for your family through that job. That is literally how God answers that prayer every day. The next thing, let's rethink our approach to work as one characterized by servanthood, creativity, and love. So with work comes thorns. So the thorns are hard bosses, difficult coworkers, seemingly impossible deadlines, sinful heart reactions, the experiences of anxiety, depression, fruitlessness, worthlessness, discontentment. Now, how do we work through the thorns of work? How does Jesus want us to respond to those thorns? How can we bring Jesus into our workplace as we attempt to follow Jesus? This is how we do it. We cultivate friendships. We solve hard problems. We serve our coworkers by going out of our way to help them with something. We create good ideas. We make cool things. We extend grace. We tell some funny jokes to break the tension of stress. We work hard and we use our gifts to bring about God's love to our workplace. When in doubt, servanthood, 
creativity, and love in all things. Servanthood, creativity, love in all things. The next thing, let's reimagine work as a mission. Let's reimagine work as a mission. I love this Tim Keller quote. Our work can be, um, our work can only be a calling if it is reimagined as a mission of service to something beyond merely our own interests. Think of work mainly as a means of self-fulfillment and self-realization slowly crushes a person and undermines society itself. Work is the low-hanging fruit of mission. How can I put myself out in the world? Work. How can I rub shoulder to shoulder with people who don't know Jesus? Work. How can I do something every day that would honor God? Work. How can I tell people about Jesus, how my faith um, impacts everything about my life? Work. If, if, uh, if we are to find purpose in our work, we must see, we must see it as a part of God's redeeming story of, create, of creation in and through the person and work of Jesus Christ. So we cultivate friendships, we, we, we expand our sphere of influence, we be a respectful employee. If you're a boss, you treat your, your, your uh, employees with respect. If you're um, uh, just a mid-level employee, you, you, you're respectful, you care for your um, coworkers, you reflect the way of Jesus in the every day. The next thing, let's believe that our work is important. Uh, Romans 12, you are, you're a living sacrifice. So every, everything that you're doing in life, and that includes a job, you're a living sacrifice. In that job, you are a living sacrifice. Ephesians uh, 2.10 says that we were created in Christ Jesus beforehand to do good works. So in this scenario, the sacred and the secular divide, Evan has talked a lot about, uh, a lot about that. Um, that divide is not helpful. A.W. Tozer writes this in The Pursuit of God. He says, one of the greatest hindrances to internal peace, which the Christian encounters, is the common habit of dividing our lives into two areas, the sacred and the secular, so that we live a divided instead of a unified life. So this is a false dichotomy between the sacred and the secular, and it's become entrenched in how we think. Luther also talks about this. He says a calling to so-called full-time Christian ministry like missions, pastoring, teaching at a seminary is often perceived as having greater value to God than those roles as this calling as like a business owner, plumber, homemaker. Sadly, such hierarchical valuing negatively impacts believers in business. He said it's pure fiction that, that popes, bishops, priests, and monks are called the spiritual estate, while princes, lords, artisans, and farmers are called the temporal estate. This is indeed a piece of deceit and hypocrisy, yet no one needs to be intimidated by it. And that for this reason, all Christians are truly of the spiritual state, where there is no difference except uh, them, uh, ex- among them except that of office. We're all consecrated priests by baptism. You are a royal priesthood, a priestly realm. So God calls every Christian equally to their work. The last thing is this, and I'll just throw this out there. Let's be okay with changing jobs when necessary. This is coming from a guy that changes jobs like every two years, okay? Um, Not this time, though. I'm done. I'm done doing that. It's too hard. But I I don't know who needs to hear this, but it's, it's okay. It's okay to change jobs. Like the Apostle Paul, he picked up his tent, and he went to a different city, and then he put it on his tent, and he started working. Sometimes it's necessary to move jobs to a more fertile soil where God can better use your talents, your gifts, your motivations to better provide for your family, serve your coworker, and enjoy your job. Wherever you land, you need to possess the same mentality of mission, servanthood, creativity, love in all things. If you're trying to figure out your calling, if you're trying to figure that out, just do something. Just do something and serve and be creative and love. Jesus helps us to return to the garden where we can renew our perceptions and ideas about work. And through Jesus, I hope we are able to reimagine what work can be. Let's pray.